Aloha everyone, I am Amanda Lee Patty, your host for the Radical Raw Authenticity Sessions, your source for inspiring, powerful, and conscious conversations with some of the world's most leading and inspiring visionary game changers. Aloha everyone, I am Amanda Patty and the host of the Radical Raw Authenticity Sessions. Tonight I'm super excited to bring to you Benny Ferguson, who is also known as the Movement Monk. How are you, Benny? Good, thanks Amanda. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on here. So Benny is the founder of the tension release technique, which is, in my opinion, one of the four leading modalities of movement to invite people to unite their mind, their breath, and their body, let go of pain so they can uh, experience more freedom with how they move and a deeper awareness with how they experience their entire lives. Would you be willing to kind of share with the listeners how you kind of came about developing the tension release technique and a little bit more about what it's all about? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I'll say that um, tension is, is a very uh, silent adversary <laughs> and it can be obvious in, in some people. For me, it was, it got to a point where it was quite obvious when, I went through a lot of sports and playing to quite a high degree uh, in my areas. And I just kind of beat my body up over the years. I, I realized that I was really focused every time I was moving my body, I was focused on the prize, focused on what was going on outside of me. And I forgot uh, actually how to feel my body. And mm -hmm. so it took such a long time. And why I say it's silent because I didn't, for a long time, I didn't notice how much tension I was holding on to at a, like a mental, emotional and physical level. And it was only until my body kind of screamed loud enough that that tension kind of crumpled me <laughs> like a vice. And I, I just went from being able to jump really high and play good sport and all the things that I loved at that time to it being painful to walk. And uh, that signaled me to do something about it. It was, it was quite a long way. I, in reflecting back, there was a lot of signs along the way that I just wasn't attuned to listen to. So um, for me, a big part of my journey is um, and this process, and it's, it's more than a technique. I've realised over the years as I've been teaching it, it's more, it's a practice that, um, that we can integrate into our daily lives rather than it just being about training. And... Yeah, so um, that served me, you know, and now my spine works better than it ever has, uh, not to mention the rest of my body. And it started with learning to feel and identify and release tension in the unfolding moments that happen. And, yeah, so there's lots of things that are involved, but that's, that's how I got started and started off for me. And I've now imparted the, these teachings and the principles with people around the world and seems to be working for them too, which is uh, really warms my heart. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. You kind of hinted on there that you um, kind of crumpled your spine and you had some sort of spinal injury. Would you be willing to expand on that a little bit further? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you would say from like a clinical term that it was somewhat of an extreme scoliosis and uh, so there was, you know, for people that aren't even familiar with that term, my spine looks like an S uh, when, uh, and not uh, if I was standing on my side profile, it looked like an S this way. And so my shoulders, it was all twisted, basically. Um, I, for me, I held uh, a dramatic around, uh, amount around my um, lumbar and my hips, particularly on the left side and my thoracic spine and my neck. So I kind of had these big three points and, um, yeah, that, that, that were the, the big bits. Um, doctors were kind of suggesting to, um, you know, there was uh, instability and in, around my lumbar spine and all, all sorts of different things. And they were talking about fusing a vertebra and, uh, I just, I couldn't fathom, uh, that 
just even being a possibility at least. And I'm sure for some people that's maybe the only option. Um, but for me, my, my discs, even though they were in a prolapsed state in certain areas, they were still, um, they were still able to be regenerated. And uh, just the doctors didn't believe that I could um, based on their previous experiences um, of other people kind of being diagnosed and going maybe with the maybe just more predictable option in terms of like at a clinical level. And um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit more specific about what it was. And um, there was a lot, so many other things. There was knee injuries and ankle injuries that were associated um, like dramatic amounts of shoulder injury, like the spine, because it's the center of the body, uh, I've noticed intersects with everything. So um, there wasn't many joints that weren't, that were balanced really. So then they were giving me that experience of being out of balance. Tension was being created. There was uneven wearing around the joints. And I basically just felt like crap. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was a really interesting point you made in there that caught my attention. And I think it would be um, really beneficial for people to hear. And based on what you said, my interpretation of it is that you're kind of connecting to your body and discovering this new method of moving was a way to really tap into your body's wisdom and a method of kind of listening to and reclaiming your personal power and your own ability to heal versus what most people tend to do, which is give their power away to these diagnoses that they receive from their physicians. Yes. There's a lot of things that we tapped into that you tapped into there. Um, it's, it's something that I believe is natural for us to be able to listen to and feel our bodies and one thing that I notice, and this was particularly with myself and also lots of people that I've worked with, is if we're disconnected from that sense, you know, let's just call it the kinesthetic sense, and let's just imagine that it goes beyond the skin, that we can even have an ability to feel our organs, feel the blood coursing through our veins, all of that sort of thing. If we're disconnected with that, then it can be really confusing. It's like, you know, people say, listen to your body, but people don't know how because it, it, it actually must be earned. It's something that's cultivated. And I believe that in our natural environment, if we're, you know, having to move around in, in nature and not just uh, sit on our butts for most of our lives, um, that, that sense is continually attuned and refined by necessity for survival. Um, yet, um, I'm not complaining. I do enjoy modern um, benefits as well. I, as much as I romanticize about being a caveman and all that sort of thing, I don't know whether that's a life that I would fully choose either. So um, I've taken upon myself to, to learn how to listen to my body and it does take practice. And what that means is um, not necessarily saying, oh, the external intervention is bad and it causes disempowerment, but it can really be even more supportive if you're involved in the process. And because when I went to chiropractors and physios and osteos, even Reiki healers, all of that sort of thing, each of them gave me their own opinion and their own experience. Some were accurate, some I just realized weren't. But the, the one thing that um, was true with all of that is I was, I just had to take their word for it. I had no involvement in the process. You know, if the chiropractor said, oh, your, you know, your cervical spine is doing this, I'm just like, okay, cool, like fix it. But then I'd go back and it was out of alignment again and I just didn't know why. So throughout that process, I was scared. I was, I was uncertain. Like I was in doubt of like so many different things and that then permeated into so many other areas of my life which affected it in um, well, just ways that weren't in alignment with the way I choose to live these days. So um, that's been a really important part of developing a practice that enables the cultivation of being able to listen to the body at progressively deeper levels. So then I'm not just kind of feeling separate 
from my body. I'm in a constant intercommunication where it's informing my mind and my mind's informing my body. And that's affected so many different things from the way I eat because now straight away I don't have to like cognitively or intellectually analyze my food. I, if I have something, my body tells me almost instantaneously whether it's right for it or not. And um, it's something that I notice in a lot of people, too, even in health, that um, we have this intellectual idea of what our body needs. It's like the latest science says it needs that, it needs that. But like it's, it's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. it's, it's based on A, someone else's research or opinion. B, it's also based on the past. <laughs> So our body's always turning over new cells, new information. Every cell has the capacity for memory. Every cell has the capacity to communicate. And if we're not able to understand that language, then we're, we're always on the back foot. You do a movement, you, like you don't know whether it's good or bad, maybe a couple of days later, uh, or you eat some food, you don't know whether it's good, maybe till 10 years later, till something, some sort of, disease or physical challenge presents itself but the information can be tapped into right away if we know how to, to quieten down and and listen and one last thing that's probably useful to say is for me and my experiences was my body in the beginning was kind of like a really torrent ocean there was a lot of stuff going on pain and, and all sorts of discomfort was like big torrent waves and they were always taking my attention. One wave would crash, the next wave would crash, the next wave would crash. So in order to listen, I've learned that we need to learn how to still those waves. So then as they start to still, we can then see our reflection, if that, if that, if that resonates and makes sense. Mm, yeah, that's, that's absolutely beautiful. And I would say for people who are disconnected or feel disconnected from their bodies, and they've kind of been in this, more cerebral state what is one way that you would encourage them to begin to connect to their body and their natural wisdom well uh, there's a good and easy way and it might sound cliched um but it's so obvious and they're already doing it we're all already doing it everyone who's living is doing it right now and that's breathing and to take it a little further the thing that's so powerful about breathing, if we really take the time to notice, and there's thousands of different techniques for different efficacy and different intent. But it's the process of taking in air, taking in life into the body. To, and if you follow it, then you can start to feel what the air pushes up against. So then all of a sudden, all of those nerves inside your body then start to kind of light up like a Christmas tree. So outside of any specific meditations or anything like that, if we can just pay attention to the feeling of the breath, feel as it goes into the torso, where it's pressing up against and it feels a little limited, where it feels space. And if we pay attention to where it feels spacious, that can be a good place to kind of go, oh, yeah, I don't, it's not all bad. <laughs> and then start to allow that space to grow within the body. If, if you really practice your breathing with intent and it doesn't have to be for a long time, just start with maybe five minutes a day of just really clear focus on that activity. Then in time, the whole torso expands. And if the whole torso can expand, think of all of the important things that are inside your torso, all of your bodily organs, uh, <laughs> like a massive network of fascia and muscles and tendons and ligaments. And it, it's really like the center of your body. So um, a lot of people take it for granted because it's so simple, because it's so obvious. But we know what happens if you don't breathe. So... <laughs> <my opinion. laughs> so rather than like kind of go through this mediocre type of breathing, why not enhance that physiological function that is the trigger for all other physiological functions? It doesn't matter how well you eat. It doesn't matter how good your exercise is. If you're not breathing in a way that is actually like massaging your body inside, then everything else will be affected. So, and it doesn't have to be complex. Just breathe in. 
Gently feel the breath raise up, feel where it's going, feel where it's not going. Maybe hold it for a moment, observe, and then breathe out. And if anyone thinks that that's a bit wishy-washy, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's, I think, one of the big things people are like, Oh, my gosh, you know, breathing, you know, what's that going to change? And yet, you know, at least my experience of working with you and seeing your other students and some of the people that I've worked with, it's just breathing can change so much just in that one simple act and really connecting to the breath and allowing that to fill up our entire body. That it's just, it's mind blowing and it's completely game and life changing just from that one simple practice. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of where things start. When, when I teach people, that's where things start. And once we get that going in, then lots of other wonderful movements and also stillness practices is the breathing will be a pre indicator of, um, I suppose, skill in all of those things. If the breathing's labored, then so will the body be. And yeah, so you can go into from a relaxation perspective, but also a physical performance perspective as well. And um, my intent is always to do life um, as long as what's you know, naturally right for me, but also doesn't, I don't need to live to 200 necessarily, but even if I only live till tomorrow, that quality of from today till tomorrow, it's beautiful. Regardless of what I'm doing, whether, you know, I'm on a beautiful island or it doesn't, doesn't matter where I am. It's, it's something, it's a level of joy and peace that you carry inside of you all the time if you choose to take the time to cultivate it. Yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. I feel like you hit on a really important point there. Because a lot of times people are always kind of striving for that next thing, striving for, you know, the next goals, whether it's, you know, finances or travel or you know, movement goals even. And yet what you hit upon is, is so precious and so important in just, you know, sitting back and breathing, enjoying the present moment and allowing your life to be fulfilled just through who you are and through the act of being that, you know, even if you die tomorrow, it's okay because you're so fully present with yourself and who you are in this moment. Hmm. And maybe there's just one thing that um, I'd like to bring up as well that you've um, brought to my attention. There's, so when we talk about it, of course, you and I have had some time, we've worked through some shit so breathing can become a more joyous experience. But I think what can stop a lot of people in the beginning is when they start to slow things down, then the stuff that they've been putting away, they've <laughs> comes up. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. So in the beginning, you know, for me in particular, when I started just paying attention to my breathing, it sucked, you know, my, my spine hurt in particular, like it just, and then all these emotions came up, all these thoughts came up. I was in tears and then I was like angry at myself for being a man and crying. You, you're a man, you don't cry, you know, all this bullshit, you know. And so it, it wasn't pleasant at the start. And um, my observation is that you can r strive and strive and strive and strive and strive. But like what, what for? Um, a lot of it we've got to uncover and kind of come back to uh, who we are outside of who we've been told that we are. And then we can start to, you know, I suppose, live in a more peaceful way, uh, live in a way that we don't feel like we have to justify ourselves. Uh, we can be respondent to what's happening in the present moment. And um, yeah. So anyway, the moral of that story is if someone is to start to go on that path is to know that it's okay to um, not be okay, <laughs> to know that it's okay to, um, for it to not be relaxing, for it to not be peaceful at the beginning. 
that's okay. It's, it's kind of part of a process of um, realizing who you are and getting to know yourself. And uh, these are just my experiences, but just something that I thought could be useful to consider for people listening. Yeah, yeah. And I would have to agree with a lot of that. And even with my own, you know, breathing practice, you know, it changes from moment to moment, day to day, based on my perception of what I'm experiencing at that particular moment in time. And some days I think breathing is, you know, it's a cakewalk. It's wonderful. It's just this amazing experience. And other days, yeah, it feels like shit. <laughs> And it's a lot of work and just the act of breathing, it will bring up emotions of all sorts of different things, whether it's sadness, anger, and shame, and it just, you know, moves up and through. Mm. Um, but one thing that you mentioned that I think is really um, important and would be beneficial for some of the people to, to hear, particularly coming from a man, is in my opinion, seeing a man who, who comes out and he says, yeah, you know what, I've worked through my shit. And there are times where I felt my emotions and I felt angry, I felt pissed off and I've cried. So I was wondering what kind of words of wisdom might you have for some of the men who might be listening and maybe having had grown up in the story where, you know, it's not okay for you to feel emotions, it's not okay for you to express your emotions and it's not okay to like tap into that side of yourself. Yeah. Well, um, to maybe describe where I came from and how I got to here can be useful. Um, I've always been, I suppose, what some people would consider as a sensitive person. Um, and I, uh, meaning like I feel things and I'm attuned to things. I notice things. I just, it's just something that's always been within me. You know, like if a girl changes her hair, something in my brain just goes, <laughs> something's different. <laughs> <laughs> or if something happens in the environment. So like I would naturally you know, maybe give that person a compliment because I noticed, you know, it just came out. Not many men that I had experienced, at least at that point in my life, uh, that was weird behavior. And um, I increasingly got feedback from um, my social environment that, that that was weird. Like that, I was actually called gay for quite a long time. And I was never confused about my sexuality at all. Not that I have a problem with any choice in sexual preference, but I knew that I enjoyed the company of women um, intimately. And um, anyway, so long, long story short, um, I repressed that for a long time because it, it didn't seem to support me in making friends. It didn't seem to support me in like getting approval from others back when I needed that. And um, I pushed it away. Uh, I also got beaten up as a kid um, by a group of people, which really shattered my confidence. So I pushed all that away and I, I set on a path to get strong. And so I like physically strong and I even lost the ability to cry for a long time. Like the tears had come up and then something inside me would just go, boom, no, that's not okay. And it just built up in my body. <laughs> anyway, um, like the, the strongness led to rigidity in my nature. Um, like I'm a Turian, uh, like as, as ast astrology from that perspective. And I don't subscribe to that too much, but um, I've definitely, I have bull tendencies, you know, I, I can be stubborn and that really enhanced that stubbornness. Like I became really rigid in business. Um, in the way that I treated my body and the way that I treated my relationships. I lost lots of relationships as I was going through like a really dogmatic nutrition stage in my life where I was like, I've got to eat this way. And if you don't eat this way, then you're a bad person. And so, you know, a lot, a lot of these things anyway, um, just to give some people kind of an idea of my journey to rather than just kind of give some wisdom without context. Um, if we fast forward into now, those sensitivities have my absolute superpower. It, once I learned how to kind of start to balance things, of, for me, using those sensitivities whilst also being grounded in the present moment, it's allowed me to notice things with my students, with myself, 
with other people in general. Um, so I can perceive things at a much deeper level than I've noticed from, um, I'm not going to generalize men um, because I think that can be dangerous, but um, that sensitivity is actually turned out to be my strength to be able to, you know, like a, a, just a, a very simple example of, um, you know, my background in martial arts, like uh, if you can fit, like read someone's body language to the degree where you can notice their breathing, where you can almost feel what they're thinking, you can start to anticipate the punch before it's even like being physically manifested. Mm. And this is, I suppose, a metaphor in many facets of life that I could use that sensitivity in a way that I suppose could also be appeared as masculine. And I don't like masculine feminine division and all of that sort of thing. But um, being able to anticipate things coming in was, was actually like really, really manly for me. Being able to listen in my relationships to uh, what my, my lady is like really communicating. <laughs> Whereas like my logical, rational kind of that part of me, which is kind of, I suppose, more natural, like men and women have differences, let's be honest, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but being able to listen beneath the words, not thinking that I'm always right. Well, there's, there's so many things, but, um, you know, whatever, I would just say to anyone who's listening, what, whoever you think you are and whatever it is to be a man, like drop that bullshit. And like, you've got a superpower. It doesn't, it might manifest in so many different ways. And uh, it's okay to cry. I, I think most women that I've met love a man that can cry. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> you know, and um, I, I don't, I don't know. Hopefully there's some, some words of wisdom, but um, don't repress what you feel is true and real just for the sake of approving, getting approval from others getting approval from your, your family, from your friends. Um, at the end of the day, it will cause unrest within yourself. And the judge, jury and executioner at your last breath is you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you have to answer to. It doesn't matter what you've achieved, or like in the outside world. I, I think we're all striving for happiness. So just be happy with who you are. <laughs> And people that don't accept that, fuck them. Pardon my language, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I say that in a really compassionate way. It just means that those people aren't, just aren't your people. Be yourself and your people will start to come around you. Anyway, so there's a lot of facets that I've maybe tapped on. Hopefully one or two points resonate so people can start to just go, men, and just go, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay with my feelings. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think what you shared is absolutely beautiful. And it's like, we've known each other for a few years. And even I hadn't heard some of those backstories and everything else. And, and hearing your story and knowing the incredible man that you are here today, it's just like there's so much just love and appreciation for for you and the path that you've walked, that it is almost making me want to tear up and cry because of who you are and who you've become through this incredible journey. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It feels much better. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not done yet, too. There's, I, I think there's always there's more truth that I can reveal and understand about myself as well. And I'm just looking to always face that as best as I can with um, humility, take on feedback from my environment, but also check in with myself, whether that's actually like true and real mm -hmm. and, um, you know, cultivating that voice of truth within myself and also a bit just being vigilant as to not, um, subscribe to my own delusion um yeah <laughs> which is easy to do yeah so i'm super curious if you would be willing to share with some of the the women who will be turning in tuning in how 
they, from a man's perspective, could support a man who's, who's on a similar journey um, as to what you've experienced? Um, yeah, I'm really big on communication. Um, men don't always get it. Like women in general, in my experience, are, are far more, um, have a stronger ability to think dialectically and by that I mean um, hold two opposing ideas simultaneously. <laughs> um, they have a stronger ability to think more complexly in general. Of course, there's exceptions to all of these rules, but um, it can be sometimes useful if um, you feel you're not getting the message across, just to be really clear and overt about it. And um, then it, it, I suppose it brings, give the man and put the responsibility on the man as well. Um, I think that's a great gift that uh, is, is often over, overlooked. Um, like call him to account is, you know, my um, girlfriend, that's probably the easiest way to describe it. Uh, she's a, a very strong woman and um, some of the most challenging but amazing moments in my relationship with her, but also in life, have been the moments where she's said, I'm going this way. If, like, if you're going to join me, then these needs that I have need to be met. And all of this stuff came up in me like, oh, who are you to tell me what to do? And all this, like, this, this kind of little boy and, like, I'll do what I want and, you know, like, all this stuff. And then I had to really ask, like, do I really truly love this person? Do I, like, is this the person that I choose to spend, you know, at least tomorrow with? And, well, the answer was yes. And so in that case, I then look at myself and go, okay, well, what's, what do I need to do to then, you know, allow that connection to flourish? And if she had not really put that clear sense of responsibility on me that like, this is what I need as a woman and I'm going to do it regardless. If you, do you know what I mean? That, that called me to account, it called me to grow and that may happen and maybe the relationship isn't right. And in that case, it's probably better to part as well. But um, yeah, I, I would say um, that's, that's one thing that's been really supportive to me rather than um, having the idea of someone trying to make me grow or do something for me more so like help create the circumstances that I can grow. Give me a challenge. Men love challenges. <laughs> you know, I think real men love challenges. And I, like, I don't like the term real men, but um, like responsibility, I, I experience is an important part of being a, like a father, you know, the, I suppose that archetypal kind of caregiver. And there's many other facets to it, of course. Um, but yeah, like, call a man to account. <laughs> yeah, I think you. I think you hit on a really, like, key point there for women because there are so many women who I talk, who have spoken with and shared conversations with, who are afraid to like really fully and strongly express themselves in a way that's asking a man to show up and and be accountable and take some sort of action out of fear of, oh, you know, if I express myself in this way, then I'm just going to be rejected. So instead of even putting it out there and creating space for the opportunity for a man to rise up to the situation, women are already shooting themselves and their male partners down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, the best relationships, whether friendships or intimate that I've experienced are when two people are full, you know, and, um, yeah. So one of the greatest gifts that a woman can give to a man is to like to feel fulfilled in herself. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yeah. there are so many women. I tend to see it more with women than men, which I don't know if it's just a female characteristic or not, where there's so many women who are looking for that other side to complete them. You know, I need a man to complete me versus I'm complete in and of myself and I'm just looking for a partner to share life with because sharing that time and that space and that experience just enriches who I already am and what I already have. Yeah. Yeah. There's a saying that I don't know whether it's a universal saying, um, but, uh, or whether it's just an Australian <laughs> saying, that, <laughs> the saying goes, it, you can't polish a turd. Um, <laughs> well, you can polish a turd, but it's still a turd. So, um, not to not to put anyone down when I say that, of course, but um, it doesn't. If if you feel shit in yourself, it doesn't matter what you add to it. it that's still going to be there. And uh, yeah, if you can address that, uh, well, I I just challenge people <laughs> to do it and then see what happens. You can go back to the old ways. <laughs> There's no pressure. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, that's such an amazing opportunity for, for growth as a person. And then if you're in relationship for growth in a relationship too, is to really look at your own shit and clean your own shit versus, you know, being that monkey who's throwing their shit onto somebody else and saying, Oh, you clean my shit for me. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of dynamics uh, whenever we have any sort of human interaction or relationship and um, hopefully that provides some insights for people that are courageous enough to maybe take a step and um, yeah, just see what fits for them. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like one of the most important relationships is the relationship that they develop and cultivate within themselves. Would you agree? Yeah, it's one of my favorite sayings, you know, it's uh, know thyself, mm. you know, know thyself in, in the body, in the mind, in the heart, know thyself in all, all facets of life. And um, yeah, it's important to me. Yeah, I think that's one of the like main things that I've seen within you that kind of sets you apart from other movement teachers in, you know, just your approach to life and your approach to teaching in general. Because it seems like there are so many kind of cookie cutter approaches out there where it's like the teacher wants to almost create identical like students, almost like they could clone themselves and create, you know, a cloned army, you know, from Star Wars or something like that. <laughs> Um, but to me, your approach is very much, and I know you've said it with um, a lot of your students and, and online several times, but the goal is not to teach you to move like me, but to teach you to move like you. Yeah. Yeah. And that will intersect directly with the question is, who am I? <laughs> and, and you don't know whether, unless you, you, I suppose, continue to test your assumptions. And challenge yourself. See what you're made of when things aren't perfect, when things aren't comfortable. And, um, you know, so I, that directly impacts all of the practices that I teach. And I might have two students doing the same practice. I teach the same, like, essence of practices to different people. And not that it interacts with them the same way, though. Like, when we look at a practice, we don't just, you know, when I, I teach it, I... I don't focus on this is the movement, you know, this is, you know, the only way to do it and all that sort of thing. It's an explorative process of, yeah, there are some things that might help that I kind of suggest along the way, but then I give the power over and say, observe how, like how you interact with that particular practice. It might tell you something about your hips or your knees or your thoughts or all of that sort of thing. But as that feedback process happens, then you continue to learn about yourself and that will open deeper understandings that you can apply to other movements, to other areas of your life. And um, yeah, so I, I'm not too fixated on, um, you know, people 
doing anything, just, just really getting to know themselves. And, um, you know, there's certain qualities that allow the body to, I suppose, have a degree of longevity uh, with being centered and being able to relax your body while, while you're doing your day-to-day -day activities. And so I, I really tend to more so focus on, on qualities that people embody inside and the movements are a process to cultivate those qualities. You then carry through into your sport, into your work, into your love life, you know, all of those different areas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at the beginning there, you mentioned it kind of takes a courageous person to be willing to you know, get to know themselves and almost peel back the layers of who we think we need to be to get to our true essence and, and who we are. And I'm curious if you would be willing to share what your biggest fear is. My biggest fear? Um, well, fear is, I suppose it's such an interesting thing because fear to me has changed over the years. I had lots of fears in the past that I might still be afraid of. It's actually interesting because I can see myself there's a snake on my t-shirt. A friend of mine uh, from India got me this t-shirt a, a few weeks ago. Um, so as uh, a child, I had an experience where I almost stepped on a, a snake and uh, there's quite venomous snakes here in Australia. Uh, this particular snake was a brown snake. Um, yeah, it can kill you pretty quickly if it gets you in the right place. And I was just kind of walking along and I felt something. It literally was under my foot. Had I completed that step, wow. I would have it. Like how this even happened, I don't know. Like what, I don't know why the snake would have even been there. It must I, Who knows? Divine timing or something. But um, anyway, it, it shook me to the core, like at a deep physiological level, there was a fear that was embedded at that point where I had a fear of snakes and really it was ultimately a fear of death. <laughs> yeah. Because like, that's where it goes. Right. I've right. almost, I've almost died a few times. So I've started to work through, uh, I suppose, becoming more at peace with my own death. And anyway, um, where I'm getting to with all of this was, uh, I still have a fear of snakes. Like it doesn't, um, it's not a pleasant, experience to consider being in the presence of a snake however in the past and even since like i wear this t-shirt as a statement and as a reminder to myself that like oh, i've got a bloody snake on my t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> right. that's scary and it actually gives me some sort of response mm. inside my body and it, it has changed so the fear is there but i'm not no longer paralyzed by it so um these days I'm okay with fears. Um, what I'm not okay is in action amidst fear um, because it doesn't give an opportunity for you to disprove that assumption. It's like, I'm afraid of heights. So I don't go up in high places. Well then how are you going to start to change the interaction with it? So every time that happens, whether you expect it or not, there it is. <laughs> it doesn't mean you go on top of the highest building and shit yourself. It, maybe you just start on a step ladder. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I, I have, I have fear um, of snakes, but um, the, the relationship with that fear, the, my ability to um, dance with that fear is, is changing all the time as uh, yeah, as I, I suppose courageously step into it you know, inquire about it. Like, why does that scare me? You know, I'm interested in that sort of thing. So does that help to answer the question? It does. It does. Yeah. And in, in my experience of, I guess my personal experience of fear and, and working with people as they work through fear is that a lot of people will, will tend to either freeze, they'll flee, they'll facade, which is kind of the like, yeah, you know, I'm not afraid of anything. Meanwhile, you know, everything underneath the surface is completely freaking out. Um, mm. And I forget what the other one is off the top of my head, but, but that's okay. So that's three out of the four. Um, and it seems like the biggest, I guess, opportunity for growth 
in our relationship to fear is, is to lean into it, is to get really comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Would you like me to add to that? Yeah, go for it. Um, well, yes. It's, um, I, I suppose it's like, uh, I have a challenge with the notion of um, being domesticated. Mm. And like domestication is really a product of, of comfort. Oh, hugely so. And, and from that births apathy and um, I just, from my experience, it, it doesn't allow us to be adaptive for when times are not exactly as we had planned. And I think that's when, that's when the good stuff in life actually happens. <laughs> when you didn't have a plan, when you had to improvise, and you just don't get that when you're striving for comfort, as many people um, can be in our, I suppose, societal norms of like, you know, make the money, retire young, you know, all that sort of thing. And um, I, I just have a little bit of a different philosophy on all of that. Of, um, <clears throat> I suppose it's all contextual, you know, like you can be uncomfortable, but you can be like, I suppose, impassioned as well with what you're doing. You know, it's one thing to be working a job that you hate and that's uncomfortable and go, oh, I've got to push. I got, Benny said, you've got to be uncomfortable and that's good because right. it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, we, I believe we need to be discerning with all of that as well. Um, but, yeah, just striving for comfort and not willing to embrace uncomfort on your journey, on your path, whatever that is. Um, uh, it just doesn't give you an opportunity to show you what you can be. And to live a life where you don't really get to know what you're made of, I, I just, for me, it's not a life well lived. Mm. And it doesn't matter what your predisposition is either. Like you could be born into a wheelchair and I have students that have uh, in that situation like they weren't born, but through circumstance, they've ended up in that situation. It doesn't mean that life stops because disability or like poor circumstance or anything like that. And if we can really be in our center and embrace the uncomfortable things that can happen along the way and just keep stepping, keep getting back up, keep on going, life can take really magical directions that you, you would just never be able to anticipate if you just were always attached to comfort. So there's just some thoughts. Yeah. And those are some really, really beautiful thoughts, you know, from, and for me, what it brings up is like just having appreciation for what we do have because we have so much and, and not just, you know, materialistic things and, and comfort things like, you know, for me, hot running water and a flush toilet are fantastic after having lived in Alaska without those things for, for three years. It's something I really appreciate, particularly in the winter is being able to, you know, go downstairs and go to the bathroom and a nice warm house and flush the toilet and be able to, you know, take a hot shower if I want to take a hot shower. Mm. Um, but also just appreciating the fact that we're alive and, and I think a lot of times we, we forget that that just the fact that we're, we're here in this body and this experience and in this time is this tremendous gift whether we have you know all of our, our limbs or not we're here for a reason and you know, are we willing to really embrace our time here while we have it? Or are we going to throw ourselves a pity party mm. before we even really get started? Indeed. Cold showers for me have been a transformative experience, actually. 
that you mentioned it. it like that for me um, was really tough at the beginning. Every day I got in, I, like I was a bit rigid about it at the beginning of like, I've got to have cold showers for X, Y, Z reason. Mm -hmm. And I noticed on the days where I was feeling a little, like I suppose fragile in my mind, it was really hard to get into the cold. As over, over time, I, I've realized that um, that's learned, it's taught me to not um, give that voice so much energy amidst discomfort. Because when it's a really unique situation, when you choose to be uncomfortable consciously, because it's very easy to turn the hot water on. And oh, a, lot yeah. of the times, <laughs> a lot of the times I did, but as I started to embrace and let go of these notions of even comfort and discomfort, and I just started to um, feel what was happening in the moment with this new stimulus that I just was less familiar with, all of a sudden, like it didn't feel cold at all. It didn't even feel a challenge. Like my body was responding in a different way that I wasn't familiar with. And I was so busy in shock with the reaction to that initial discomfort that I didn't allow it to permeate and transform and change within me. So, so sometimes amidst discomfort, I've learned that um, like sometimes even on the fringe of something completely different, it's actually not, uncomfortable in a conventional way you can you can completely change it's just a matter of perspective and being open to um, a different experience than what you thought it might be yeah absolutely and and on the topic of cold showers for some of the people who aren't familiar with some of the the benefits of taking cold showers would you be willing to share some of those um yeah i always like to just comment on my direct experiences and for me it's like just very simply when i i have a hot shower i my body just starts to slow down and i kind of like feel the <laughs> uh, uh, like i no, i have a shower most most mornings and um so when I have a cold shower. It does the opposite. It excites me. You know, it like, <laughs> it, it gets things going. Like it, it makes, um, like one thing that I've learned with cold water at varying degrees is it causes a certain physiological response. And I can confirm this just in my own body. And I've, there's lots of other people who have documented it, but, um, it can induce shivering. And that shivering is like, an involuntary muscle muscular contraction to generate heat. So as the body starts to like do this or vibrate at a higher rate, then things start to get stimulated. Energy starts to improve. All of these other wonderful things start to improve. And the other is to relax and soften with the hot water. Both have their purpose. But for me at the start of the day, I don't want to do that. I like to, you know, like <laughs> have some energy to live my day. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really powerful for that. Uh, depending on how cold it is. And I always recommend just go gradually mm -hmm. and build up into it. But, um, but that was a really unique response that I didn't, um, anticipate in the beginning of just the power of your body actually like oscillating, vibrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for that, that causes relaxation. Yeah. And that gets deeper and deeper and deeper into the body as the body's trying to generate heat more deep inside as that's happening around your internal organs. Will they like, if there's any stagnation and all of that sort of thing, things start to circulate better. It's pretty important to have your organs doing what they're supposed to do and, you know, nice and healthy. And so that, that's a couple of the benefits that I've noticed. And yeah, but I just feel better. It helps me think clear, more clearly. I tend to not vest too much. Um, you know, I don't praise to cold and praise to anything. It's just a tool. It just causes a certain physiological response. And um, I, I found if we can just 
consciously harness it, it can be beneficial to health and other areas of life. Yeah. Yes. Something I thought um, was really interesting is your your description of shivering, and you know yeah. it it increasing kind of the vibration of the body in that time, you know as the as the body is shivering because it's literally shaking things up and it's you know stirring the molecules and getting them to to move around. So to me that was a, a super interesting perspective and a way of looking at it because so many people are like oh you know shivering isn't I mean it's of course, it's a natural mechanism for your body to heat up and get warm, but people think like, oh, you know, it's constricting. Yeah. And oh, yeah. I don't want to shiver. I don't want to be cold. But when we sit and we look at it from, you know, a really vibratory way, then like, yes, you know, it's increasing your vibration. Things are moving faster. Things are opening up and we're essentially shaking loose our shit. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's, it's just a question of allowance. And, um, yeah, if, if we resist that shivering, well, then, like, it just, it can't take full effect. Yeah, it can't generate heat. So we might be shivering on the outside and tense in the inside. And that <laughs> right, heat, right. <laughs> heat can't get, get there. So, um, yeah, a lot of all of these things, um, particularly when uh, one of the important things when I teach is, is, teaching how we interact with these physiological functions, you know, how we interact with uh, the movements that are going on inside the body, so contraction and relaxation and um, being in participation with all of that and not in resistance and rigidity or flaccidity around different physiological functions. Um, so the body can just kind of do what it needs to do. It's really clever. <laughs> It is, it is really, really clever and, and it's interesting, you know, having worked with you for a while and you know, it's, it's winter here and I've you know, slipped more than a fair number of times and, and these slips and trips on the ice would, would typically in the past have been things that I would have wound up, you know, falling on my ass <laughs> doing, but it was really interesting. It's like without even sitting and thinking and really acknowledging what was happening it's like, yes, I slip, and then there's the balance. It's like that really deep centeredness was there in a way that I personally hadn't experienced prior to experiencing the work that you offer. I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm super curious. Um, a while ago, you had mentioned that you were in the process of planning some tours in in Europe. Hmm. Are those are those still are those still underway? Still in motion. Yeah. Um, I have um, quite a few students in Europe, and uh, some of them I haven't even met in person yet because most of the way I teach is um, via this medium, and uh, it's incredible can be incredibly effective uh, so it means that i don't always have to be in the same room as my students but um i would also like to meet some people in person and um, that i've been teaching for quite some time so it's naturally happening that way uh, i'd love to continue to share what i'm doing around the world and you know meet people face to face that kind of it's always like just really good. You know, even you and I, we've conversed so many times via this medium yet haven't met in flesh yet. It feels like we have, but um, yeah. So uh, I will be going to Europe. Um, things haven't been confirmed yet. They're in motion and uh, getting some support to allow that to happen. And um, yeah, so I'm also not, um, I don't, I'm not too attached to being one of those teachers that needs to tour around the world to be significant either. Mm -hmm. um, like I can really do all the wonderful things from anywhere in the world. And I've noticed a lot of teachers uh, tour and tour and tour, and then they really kind of wear themselves down and they lose their own essence and their ability to impart that to others. So that's really important to me as I continue to tour more and more as more people um, value and find out about my work. But um, it'll be probably one area at a time. So then I can make sure that I can keep myself full um, to pass that on. Um, my teacher always says, um, you can't give from a cup that it doesn't have things to give with. 
yeah, I'm paraphrasing, but um, so I, I only like to give them a cup that's full to overflowing. And um, yeah, so my cup's full to overflowing now. And so I will travel and, um, and share that. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And what a fantastic piece of wisdom from your teacher as well. And that's something I tend to share a lot with people. And you know, moms in particular tend to be kind of really bad <laughs> at filling up their, their cup first. And, and it's so important, I think, for us to, in general, to give ourselves permission to fill our own cup before giving to others and, and constantly replenishing our our supply and our, our love for ourselves before we share it. Yeah. And uh, one of my um, students said this to me the other day where he's uh, the person in his life um, said, Oh, that's selfish. Mm. Actually, you know what? It's selfish to not give to yourself. Right. Right. The implications of not giving to ourselves, and I say this because there's so many people that don't, that need to, and I'm, I'm not one to tell people what to do, but, like, seriously, um, give to yourself. <laughs> it's okay. It's actually not selfish because the process of giving to yourself allows the flow of giving. And if you don't have a place to give, like, you, you begin to disdain generosity because it's so painful because you're on like you're an oily, you're living on fumes. That might be to your kids. That might be to your loved ones. That might be in work relationships. Those interactions overflow and affect people. And we're all on the same planet, breathing the same air. You know, it like we all look the same on the inside. <laughs> so, um, yeah, give, give to you. It's, not, it's actually not selfish. It can go the other way as well and turn into narcissism and all of that sort of thing, but that's not what we're talking about. Definitely not what I'm talking about. Just a small gift of spending some time with yourself. It can be in silence. It can be, yeah. But um, that's, that's one of the sole things that inspires me about the movement practices that I teach is like giving a gift to yourself every day. It's, it's a gift. So you can do with that whatever you choose. You continue to you not only fill your cup, but the cup gets bigger in time. I feel like I've got a bloody swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't tell people what that feels like. I, like I always just invite them to come and learn to experience what that can feel like. It's not easy, you know, to dig a swimming pool, take some effort. And to fill it up, <laughs> take some time. <laughs> but once it's there, your capacity to give to yourself, your capacity to give to others, it, I, I don't know, it almost knows no bounds. And um, I don't know, that's a good, good way to live for me. And uh, I, I think other people could, could benefit from that. The world could benefit from that of people not feeling so strung out and um, there's a lot of complexities sometimes like, you know, like you would know like as well as many people, like the demands of being a single mother and all of that sort of thing. I hope it's okay that I share oh, that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, so like it's, you know, here's some man going, Oh, like just give to yourself. Like some people don't, they don't, have the same liberty that I have necessarily. We all have different life circumstances and I have so much respect and compassion for raising children. You know, I, I think that that's just, that's a task that is so demanding. And uh, it actually makes me sad sometimes because I don't think it's, it's, um, it's what the way that we were like the too much pressure, it's too much pressure on one person, you know, like, we need supportive community and people around us to do that sort of thing. So like for someone like you who like has done that and also taken the time to give to herself so she can keep passing that on to her children. Like that's, it's a really 
rare thing that I see. And I, I believe I'm just kind of using you as an example because um, even, even if you, you're going like you're going, Oh, I don't have time. You know, like I've got it. I'm in survival mode. I've got to take care of the bills. I've got to take care of the kids. I've got to take care of this. I've got to cook the food, got to clean the house, got to do all whatever. And I'm being journalistic, of course, but it might just be five minutes of just taking some time to yourself. We all have five minutes. And then you might notice that that really feels good. And there's, there's positive impacts into your life, into the way you feel. And depending on the practice, you know, maybe the way your body functions as well. And then all of a sudden, um, life can not be as challenging. Um, yeah, there's, there's just some anecdotal thoughts, but I, I feel it's probably important to not make things so like high in the sky always. And um, just acknowledge that if uh, people are that are listening to this, like they are really kind of going, I don't have the time. Um, I call bullshit. Mm -hmm. yeah you, you actually do and if you don't maybe you need to reflect on the way you're making choices and also you you know like you can ask for support <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and it's like there's so many nuggets like golden nuggets in there and what you what you shared and you know what i've experienced in my my journey as a single mom and, and having been through, you know, times in my life, particularly when I first got divorced, where I had to let go of the story of, you know, mothers are martyrs. And if you're not a martyr, mm -hmm. then you're not a mother. And, you know, if you're not a martyr, then you're not a good mother type of thing to the point where it just, it completely flattened me and drove me into the ground to the point where I was like, Okay, I need to stop. <laughs> you know, capital S T O P. Breathe. Recenter myself and say, how can I move forward from this place? Because giving from a cup that is empty does not serve anybody. It doesn't serve me, it doesn't serve my kids, it doesn't serve anybody I work with. So how can I how can I fill that cup up and bring it back to self? Like what's one simple action I can take today? What's one thing that I can do for myself today? Whether it's, you know, setting the alarm five minutes earlier and, and laying in bed or sitting in bed and just breathing. And and you know, waking up in the morning and saying, geez, you know, thank God I woke up today and I can breathe in and out. Thank God I have a roof over my head and a bed to sleep in and clothes on my body. And then, and then slowly bring it up from, from there. Cause some moms are like, gosh, you know, I'd like nothing more than to be able to sit and read a magazine. So it's like, okay, you know what, how long does it take you to read a magazine? Maybe half an hour. You know, let's, let's plug in and actually schedule time in your schedule. Make yourself a date, make yourself a priority, make a commitment to yourself, to your health and wellness. Because when you really commit to you, it just spills out to everybody else and everybody else in that field is influenced by it in a really positive and, and beneficial way. Mm. Yeah, to getting to that point though, it is. It's letting go of all those bullshit stories. <laughs> Let's say I can't do this or I don't deserve to do this or if I do this I feel guilty yeah and a good um, for me in terms of a practice it just sparked something if I could add mm -hmm. um, whenever you have a reason just be cautious <laughs> whenever someone has a reason for something be cautious and, and what I mean by that is um, reasons like the reasoning mind is, is like a big filing cabinet and a filing cabinet. We know what that does. It stores information, but it's past information. So if we're choosing to live our life and I like, this is a way that I choose to live. It's based upon reason. I do this for this reason because I believe this or whatever all the time. Then we're always living in the past. So then we'll always experience 
the result of what we've put in that filing cabinet. Mm -hmm. Then it starts to sort of bring, how do we make decisions? You know, like <laughs> all of that sort of thing. And like, we need to cultivate a state of presence where we can be attuned to what's happening in the moment. Maybe we, in the moment, we go, what do I truly need right now? And we have this voice going, you need to clean the house. You need to do this. You need to do that. <laughs> da, 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 da. Because uh, blah, 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 blah. Right. The because. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then beware. <laughs> because that because, that reason is pulling you back into what you've already experienced. And we need to ask ourselves a question like, is that, am I happy in my life? Truly. And if not, am I going to be more happy by continuing to do the same thing? <laughs> you know, Albert Einstein said, you know, the definition of insanity is repeating the same action <laughs> over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Right. So we, we need a vehicle to cultivate presence, to cultivate being able to be attuned to our body, to our thoughts, to our emotions in the present moment so we can make decisions that lead us to a place of deeper fulfilment. Whatever that looks like, there's no one way. <laughs> but presence is universal. <laughs> Either you got it or you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not many things I see as black and white, but like, and to have it, you need to, like, you need to give it some love. You need to give it some nourishment. You know, we've got two ears and one mouth, and of course we're doing a lot of talking, but throughout my daily life, I'm, you know, it's more of this than this. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> There's my sermon. <laughs> I'm right there with you on that one. You know, I have a I have a mouth that I know how to use when it's time to use it, but I wind up listening far more than I wind up speaking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's just so much more that we can pick up on and, and learn about ourselves and the world around us by listening and experiencing than talking. Yeah. And all of these things to contextualize it and that disharmony, like when we're not really feeling like true to ourselves, when we're not really feeling centered, causes tension, causes tension in our mind, causes tension in our physiology. It like, and that tension is a silent like challenger. Like we said at the beginning, it, it really can, it can rob a lot of vitality from you. It causes obstruction and inefficiency of your physiology, <laughs> just at a core level. So all of the things that we've been talking about, um, like those disharmonies, those things that where we feel like there's this thing inside of us that we need to do, but there's this other voice that says you shouldn't do that for this reason that can then cause tension in certain areas of your body that can grow over time. And then you look back on life and that tension has turned into something that's really serious. And this isn't to invoke fear, but the voice starts small, the tension starts small and unnoticeable and it grows. So if we don't learn each and every day to come like to release and in the beginning, you'll just be releasing stuff from the past. Oh yeah. <laughs> that will happen for a while, <laughs> you know, to get, get back to a state where over the course of a day, you can then come back to, you know, degree where there's like a, a sense of peace. You know, I'm not even going to say, without pain and all of that sort of thing, because pain happens. Pain's not necessarily a bad thing. It's how we dance with it. Yeah. But if we can get to a state where we can kind of be in each unfolding moment 
able to release those tensions, whether it's tensions in an interaction, tensions in that inner voice, tensions in uh, like some sort of an emotional response to something or to ourselves, tensions in our physiology in relation to our environment. All of these things can be trained and can be cultivated. And the better you get at it, uh, it's just the kind of better life gets. <laughs> yeah, I like to think of it as like the more fluid life gets. You know, yeah. Like it, it's, yeah. It's not so much a, it's not a struggle as much. It doesn't have this like jerky start, stop, start, stop. You're able to just like, I don't know, dance with the flow of life a lot easier, you know, and, and it doesn't mean that, yeah, there's no pain. It just means you don't have to suffer with the pain. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a really important distinction that you've just made. Mm. And, um, yeah. So, you know, it's like I, I was moving a bed the other day and it was heavy and like the old me would have tried to just use my arms <laughs> To move this bed when that took would take a lot of effort and would actually build up more tension in my body but then as i put my hands on this bed i just relaxed my weight into the ground and all of a sudden i felt this heaviness and then i pushed my foot into the ground my whole body was participating in the action and the bed just moves so effortlessly so we can have the same outcome it's sort of like if you have the choice to have the same outcome with less effort, uh, which would you choose? <laughs> <laughs> it's as really simple as that. Right, right. Yeah. You it's, choose to walk down the street and for that to be less strenuous, to like pick up your kids, to crawl, do whatever, play, whatever, whatever it is, even stand up and work. If you could do that with less effort, would you? And what I will say confidently is you can. <laughs> you can. It doesn't take as much as you would think. But you've got to practice. <laughs> you've got to practice being in a state of effortlessness, being able to release the tensions that cause uh, restriction in your life, that obstruct fluidity and the natural flow of things of your physiology of your thoughts of your emotions all of those things so it's really just a choice it might seem boring it might seem like you the other things are more important but let's think in a bigger perspective you know like what would you really like for for your body for the way you feel about it on the inside like what's that experience if you dared to dream, what would you like it to be? Yeah, yeah, that is so beautiful. And for people who are ready and willing to dare to dream and take their I guess their, their dreams and aspirations of what they would like to experience in terms of their lives and really embody that and have that be a part of, gosh, each waking moment. How can they, they find out more about you and what's a good way for, for them to contact you? That's easy. Um, so I share lots of resources. I'm really big on education and teaching and, and, and just sharing my experiences as well. Um, and I do a lot of that at my website, which is movementmonk.xyz, not .com, .xyz. And uh, they can go there and read things, see videos of me doing things and blah, 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 all that sort of thing. And uh, they can also contact me via the contact form on that page. Otherwise, they can send me an email at aloha at movementmonk. Dot X, y, Z. I've got social media and all of that sort of thing. People can find it. Just look up Benny Ferguson or Movement Monk and chances are they'll find me on one of those streams. But uh, yeah, short of giving you my postal address and uh, 
personal <laughs> phone number, <laughs> they're probably the best ways that you can get in contact. And um, yeah, like, I think it's good for people to know also that I don't work with everyone. Um, mm-hmm. I, I work with a certain type of person who's ready to, to put in the time, who's ready to actually cultivate something that's worthwhile. And um, that doesn't, it's not for everyone as well. So, you know, just for people that are watching, if uh, I suppose if someone's come this far in the video, they're probably uh, fairly interested in all of this sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So like, I, I really only like to have conversations with people who actually are ready to take responsibility. And um, yeah. So if you are ready to take responsibility, then let's have a conversation. Yeah. And uh, I'd be happy to help. And if I can, yeah, if that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't know until we have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Beautiful. So I will include the, the links to those so people can, can easily find them and look at some more of the resources that you offer. And, yeah, absolutely, if, if people feel that, you know, this resonates for them and they're really ready to commit to themselves and, and take the leap. I have no doubt in my mind that they'll be in touch and share an incredible conversation and experience with you. We can grow old and be, feel good in our bodies together. <laughs> you know, I think that's really like my selfish interest that I just work with a bunch of people who are still fit and healthy, you know, as they age, so I can have people to play with. (laughs) (laughs) So I'd love to play with people now, like I'm still young, but um, as I age, I I would love to just keep having people to play with. So, you know, people that want to, would like to do that. Um, You know, (laughs) there's my selfish motivations. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. Yeah. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for having me, Amanda. Yeah, I am. Um, I trust that, you know, people that have been listening, they've received that little, that one thing that they need to hear to take a step. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, for me to share, you know, my journey and my gifts. And uh, it's wonderful to impart them um, with the intent to help others. Yeah. Great. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure having you.